In the last video, we demonstrated how a risk neutral price can eliminate arbitrage on a European call option using the one period binomial model. This video will build further to show how we can derive two unknowns, the risk neutral price of the option and the delta for the number of shares we should hold to hedge our position using Stephen Shreve's Stochastic Calculus for Finance Part 1, pages 4 to 8. So from page five, we're introduced to new variables, V1H and V1T, that represent the payoff from a security at time one. For example, if you hold an option with a strike price of five, then the payoff, V1H, will be three if the stock price is eight at time one, and the payoff, V1T, will be zero if the price of the stock is one at time one. So be sure not to confuse V1H with X1H and vice versa for tails as X1H and X1T represent the value of our portfolio, which accounts for the position held with the stock and money market. Now we want these two values to be equal if we efficiently price our option and hold the correct delta in a stock to hedge our exposure. We want to solve for a fair price of the option, which is denoted as X0. When we've solved for a fair price, we're then able to perfectly replicate its exposure in a portfolio of stock and money market accounts, as we've done in the previous video. If we revisit a formula for our portfolio value at time one, x1, it's equal to delta at time zero multiplied by stock price at time one, plus the interest rate for one time period on our position in the money market, and then that money market position is equal to the initial wealth, which is x0, minus the delta multiplied by the stock price at time zero. We can then see how this formula can be simplified by first taking out delta zero, and then simplifying the formula by extracting one plus r by x zero out of the formula, leaving us with the formula for x one as seen at the top of page six. We're now going to see how we can solve for x zero using this term of x one. At the top, we have our formula for X1 with respect to the cash position X0 and the stock prices of S1 and S0. As we want our cash position to be equal to the value of the option at time one, we want X1 to be equal to V1 regardless of heads or tails. Given there are two possible outcomes for the option, we want to solve for our cash position X1H to be equal to V1H when the coin is heads, and for X1T to be equal to the portfolio value of V1T if it's tails. So using the X1 formula, we simply replace the stock value at time one of S1 for the stock value at time one for heads and tails respectfully. This leaves us with the formula for X1H and X1T, which we want to equate to V1H and V1T. This means our portfolio position you know, for X1 will always be equal to the payoff of the option, which is V1H or V1T. If we take our formula for X1 and equate it to V1H and V1T, we can divide both sides by one plus R for a slightly simplified formula. The X0 is no longer multiplied by one plus R and S0 is also left alone. What we now have is a representation of our portfolio value for a heads and tails coin flip with respect to x0 and delta0, the two values we're trying to derive. To solve for x0, we will use our two formula for x1h and x1t. As we know, the probability of heads and tails are p and q respectfully. We also know q is also equal to one minus p. So I can introduce these probabilities to our equation. We're not really concerned with what p and q are as our price for the option will have to account for either heads or tails regardlessly. But what we're going to do now is actually introduce p and q just so we can build a relationship between our formulae as we will soon see. So after applying p and one minus p to our formula, we can now begin to add them together. So first I will add the x0 components together in green. So we have p xo plus xo minus p xo. Then I will add the middle components together in blue for our S1H and S1T formula. And lastly, for the equality on the right hand side with reference to V1H and V1T in orange. 
We will now simplify this equation by removing PXO values that cancel out in green and then taking delta out of the blue formula. Next, we can remove the PSOs from our blue formula as they also cancel out. And one thing that's quite interesting here is that you might notice that we have 1 over 1 plus r minus p over 1 plus r. And 1 minus p is also the same as q. So we can simplify this a little bit further by making it q over 1 plus r to remove two of these fractions. I'll move the 1 over 1 plus r from the squared brackets. So we have p, s1h, and q, s1t. And then if I clean up the right hand side of the equation, we can take 1 over 1 plus r out. And in a similar way before, we can equate 1 minus p fractions into q, and that's going to leave p v1h and q v1t in the squared brackets. We now have a simplified equation for x0 and delta 0. Uh, but then if you notice within these squared brackets, we have s0 on its own. If we take s0 and equate it to the left side of the squared brackets, that will leave us with a direct formula for x0 as you'll see in 1.1.7 in the book. Now before we solve for delta, we can also derive the probabilities of p and q from the up and down factor with interest rate. We've already seen our formula for x0, assuming that s0 is equal to that left hand side of the squared brackets of 1 over 1 plus r multiplied by p s1h plus q s1t. We can change S1H and S1T with respect to S0 by simply multiplying S0 by the up and down factor of heads and tails respectively. Next, I'll take S0 out of the squared brackets and place it as a numerator. We can multiply both sides by 1 plus R. Now we can divide both sides by S0. And given that Q is equal to 1 minus P, we can now solve for P and Q, leaving the two equations of 1.1.8. Lastly, we will solve for delta by subtracting our formulae for x1 and v1. I'll then take delta 0 out of the brackets in the blue formula and simplify the orange formula by bringing v1h and v1t to the numerator. The delta 0 and s0 cancel out on the left hand side and we can simplify the v1 formula into one fraction I can then multiply both sides by 1 plus r to remove them from the equation on the left to leave delta 0 multiplied by s1h minus s1t equals v1h minus v1t. Simply moving the s1h minus s1t over will leave our formula as seen in 1.1.9 and this is known as the delta hedging formula. So to conclude this video I'll inject our binomial example where r is equal to 0.25 v1h for that option is going to be 3 and v1t is 0 and p and q are equal at 0 0.5. So simply plugging in these values for our xo formula will leave 1.2 and then the delta 0 value is going to be 0 0.5. So with this in mind we know that if an agent sells a security that's taking a short position in it that will expose them to v1h and v1t at time 1 of 3 and 0 they can hedge their exposure by purchasing delta zero shares of 0 0.5, given an interest rate of 0 0.25, and that they've sold this option for 1.2. I'll end the tutorial with some closing remarks on the variables of P and Q. So we've employed risk neutral probabilities in our model where P and Q satisfy our equation of 1.1.2 in the book. The risk neutral probabilities don't actually hold in real life though. As an investment in a security that returns just the risk-free rate of investment, that wouldn't really be incentivized given the risk of that investment. Therefore, the risk-weighted return on the security must always be greater than the risk-free rate because investing in a security is going to introduce more risk than the risk-free rate. So we define and use P and Q for the very purpose of solving for delta zero and x zero the equation we derive for x0, the risk-neutral pricing formula, will work regardless to the values of p and q.